Hi and welcome to the last two modules in module 8 where we will talk about the JPEG compression standard. As we said before, an image stored in RAW format occupies a lot of space. Uh, normally a color picture will use 24 bits per pixel um, and there are a lot of pixels in an image produced by a camera today. By contrast, an image encoded with the JPEG standard will be encoded at approximately 2 bits per pixel and it will be very hard to tell the difference between the two. So how does this magic happen? JPEGs achieves these remarkable results by combining three fundamental lines of attack. The first one is called transform coding and it means that we actually encode the image in the Fourier domain rather than in the space domain. The second is variable quantization. We allocate a different number of bits to different parts of the image and this is based on psychovisual tests that have been carried out to determine what is important to the eye and what is not. And the third ingredient is called entropy coding and it is a technique from information theory that allows us to shrink the size of the bitstream encoding the image even more. Hi and welcome to module 8.5 in which we will talk about image compression. We will review the reason why we can compress images, namely the redundancy that is present in natural images, and then we will look at the fundamental ingredients in an image coding system. But first, let's start with a very simple thought experiment that will convince you that image compression is a necessity. Consider an image of size 256 by 256, encoded at 8 bits per pixel. The amount of storage that an image like that requires is on the order of 500,000 bits. Now, from a purely combinatorial point of view, each bit in this image can be set independently to 0 or to 1. So the total number of possible images of size 256 by 256 at 8 bits per pixel is a staggering 2 to the power of 524,288. To put that in perspective, we can change the base and express this as a 10 to the power of 157,000 and something. Now compare this to the number of atoms in the universe, which is estimated to be 10 to the power of 82. This means that clearly the subset of meaningful images of size 256 times 256 must be very, very, very small compared to the number of all possible images. Let's take a different approach. Assume that we can actually collect all the images that exist in the world, pictures, drawings, and so on and so forth. And suppose that we can list them in a massive encyclopedia of images. Now that we have a list and a catalog of all possible images, we can indicate each image in the encyclopedia just by giving the cardinal number in the list. Now, to put some numbers in this thought experiment, let's do this very simple back-of-the-envelope calculation. Current estimates say that on the Internet we have about 50 billion images and pictures that are floating around. Let us assume, to simplify matters, that all of these images are encoded at 8 bits per pixel and they have size 256 times 256. Well, each of these images encoded in raw format requires in excess of 500,000 bits. If we use the enumeration scheme from the Encyclopedia of Image, where we can identify each image by its index, we just need to provide this number to specify an image and therefore the cost to encode an image is simply the log in base 2 of the number of images in the list. So that's about 36 bits per image to encode all possible images in the Internet today. The downside of this encoding scheme is that it requires a lot of side information. In other words, I can send an image to you by sending you its index number, but unless you have the full encyclopedia at your disposal, you won't be able to see the image itself. So on the one hand, we have indication that there is an enormous redundancy in the amount of space that we allocate to an image. And on the other hand, we have a sort of lower bound that tells us that the number of images that make sense, in theory, could be encoded with approximately 30 bits per image. Neither approach gives us a solution to the problem, so we need to analyze the physical properties of images in more detail. The idea is to exploit the physical redundancy in images to reduce the bit budget. But of course we have to be careful and define redundancy specifically in terms of the human visual system. In order to allocate bits to features that matter, we have to find out what these features are. And thankfully researchers have worked a lot on this problem and ran lots of psychovisual experiments to find out the things that matter the most. 
With this knowledge at hand, we can go ahead and define what is called a lossy compression scheme. In other words, an image encoding system that will discard the information that it deems irrelevant with respect to either the intelligibility or the quality of an image. So let's look at the key ingredients that will lead us to the JPEG compression scheme. The first is compressing the image at block level. We'll see this with an example in just a second. The second ingredient is using a suitable transform to move the blocks into a different domain. So we do a change of basis that will make it easier for us to decide which parts to keep and which parts to discard. Smart quantization is the way we will go about discarding irrelevant parts by allocating very few or no bits at all to some of the transform coefficients, we will be able to reduce the bit rate selectively. And finally, entropy coding is a technique that we will borrow from information theory and it will allow us to compress even more the bit stream that we have obtained from the previous smart quantization. To understand the importance of block coding, let's see what we can do if we decide to compress an image at pixel level. The only thing we can do in that case is to reduce the number of bits that we allocate to each pixel. This is equivalent to quantizing the image using fewer levels. And in the limit, we cannot go below one bit per pixel. So if we try and apply this to our standard image, we get something that has completely distorted the content of the original image. So pixel level quantization only takes us so far before image quality is completely compromised. And now by comparison, let's look at a very simple compression strategy that operates at block level. What we do here is we divide the image into blocks and then we code the average value with 8 bits. We use 3 by 3 pixel blocks using 8 bits for each block so we use a little bit less than 1 bit per pixel and the result is what you see here on the right. If you look attentively at the details you might perceive some jagged edges around for instance here. Um, these are the so-called block artifacts and come from the fact that we have split the image into small blocks. But nonetheless, the overall result is definitely much, much better than what we would obtain using pixel-level compression at the same bit rate. The power of block-level compression comes from the fact that in each block we exploit the local correlation between neighboring pixels, and at the same time, since blocks are independent, we separate the coding for different parts of the image. The block scheme we've seen just before is a very simple, naive one. We just take the average value of the pixel. And the result is that we have noticeable block artifacts, even though our blocks are very, very small, 3 by 3. Can we do better? Well, in order to do better, we have to introduce a second ingredient, which is transform coding. To give you an idea of how transform coding works, assume you have a simple one-dimensional discrete time signal, and assume that you will encode each sample with R bits per sample. So if the signal is like this one here, Storing the signal, as is, will require n times r bits. You have n samples, r bits per sample. But now, suppose you take the DFT of the signal, and it turns out that the DFT looks like this. Well, what happened was that the signal was a sinusoid that corresponded to one of the basis vector for uh, the length of the signal. But with this representation, in theory, instead of having n r bits to code the signal, we just need to code two DFT coefficients, possibly together with their position. And so the amount of bits that we spend to encode the signal is definitely less than an R. So the lesson that we get from the simple example is that we would like a transform that, when transforming an image block, captures the important features of the block in just a few coefficients, so that we can just encode those coefficients and discard all the rest. Also, we would like the transform to be efficient to compute, because we're interested in an efficient compression algorithm. The answer to these two requirements is a transform called a discrete cosine transform, or DCT for short. Mathematically, the DCT can be expressed as such. It is very similar to the DFT, except that the basis functions are based on cosines rather than on complex exponentials. The advantage of this formulation is that the transform is a purely real transform when applied to real signals such as images. Instead of studying the structure of this double summation, we can just exploit our intuition about basis expansions and realize that each coefficient of the DCT is just the inner product, namely a measure of similarity between the image and each of the basis functions. 
Now remember, we're operating at block level. So if, for instance, we're going to split our image, as is customary in JPEG, into 8 by 8 pixel blocks, it means that n here is equal to 8, and the same in the other direction. And so we will have 64 basis functions for the space of 8 by 8 images. We can actually plot these basis functions like so, and here we have increasing values of the index k1 and of the index k2. And we can see that by computing the DCT, we're actually correlating, namely measuring the similarity between an image block and each one of these patterns here. Some patterns will capture an edge-like behavior, some patterns will capture a texture-like behavior, but in general there will be a pattern that will be able to capture most of the information contained in a small block. And this is really the philosophy behind transform coding in JPEG. Now when it comes to smart quantization, what we need to do is to change a little bit the definition of quantization that we have seen in Module 7. The idea is that we want to be able to discard as many values of the transform as possible. And by discarding them, we mean that we set them to zero, and therefore we don't need to specify their amplitude. This is achieved by using so-called dead zone quantizers that we will see in just a second. The second part of smart quantization is being able to change the quantization step according to the importance of the coefficients that we are quantizing. So key coefficients will require a fine-grained resolution, therefore more bits will be allocated to them, whereas less important coefficients can be quantized rather coarsely. So let's go back to the quantization model that we saw in Module 7. Suppose that our input is bounded between minus 2 and 2, and that we're using 2 bits to quantize the input. Then we're dividing the input range into 4 intervals, because we have 2 bits per input sample, and we are associating a representative value to each interval, which happens to be the midpoint. Mathematically, in this case, we can say that the quantized value is simply the floor of the input value plus 0 0.5. You can see, however, that in this model there is no zero value in the output. If the input signal is even slightly positive, it will get associated to 0 0.5, and if it's slightly negative, to minus 0 0.5, but there is no zero. A dead zone quantizer, on the other hand, uses intervals that have the same width as a standard quantizer, but centers an interval around zero. So all values, in this case, from 0 0.5 to minus 0 0.5, will be mapped to zero. So small values will be quantized to zero. And then the rest proceeds with the usual staircase, so everything is shifted by 0 0.5. From 0 0.5 to 1.5, we will have a representative value of 1. Mathematically, this is equivalent to saying that the quantization scheme simply rounds the input value to the nearest integer. You can notice now that we have an asymmetric characteristic for the quantizer, so in a sense we're wasting half a bit. We can add the level to the right side or to the left side if needs be, but the advantage of having a dead zone largely offsets the loss of half a bit. And finally, let's consider the last ingredient in the success of JPEG, which is entropy coding. The idea behind entropy coding is to minimize the effort to encode a certain amount of information. And the way we do that is by associating short symbols to values that are frequently used. Now, this might sound familiar to you, and the reason is because it is familiar. The Morse code that was invented in 1836 is a typical example of a coding scheme where we use very short symbols for frequently used values. So, for instance, the most common letter in the English alphabet is the letter E, and therefore the symbol that we use to encode E is the shortest possible symbol in the Morse alphabet, the dot. And then we can find for instance, which is the second most common letter in the English alphabet, turns out to be I, which gets two dots, and so on and so forth. So Morse code was invented to minimize the time that it would take to send a message over a telegraph line, but we can use exactly the same principle to try and minimize the amount of memory that we must use to encode a bit stream. We will see this in more detail in the next module.